Okay, so I am going to be speaking this morning about the life of Ruth. Um, and I'm really excited about this because this is one of my favourite characters from the Bible. So, um, yeah, I'm going to um, be talking about a journey that Ruth makes because the story of Ruth is all structured around this journey um, from Bethlehem to Moab and then from a field to a threshing floor. And as I was thinking about this and preparing this and and getting into the story of Ruth, I saw that this journey, this physical journey that Ruth takes, parallels a spiritual journey that she takes from being a widow with very little hope to being a married, released, full person, um, full of hope and promise, and in a place of intimacy with her Redeemer. And I believe this morning that that, that God is wooing us to a place of intimacy with himself. And how did Ruth get from, um, from that place of, um, of, of kind of uh, hopelessness into that place of intimacy? And I believe that it's, she made three choices. She chose to surrender. She chose to serve. And she chose to pursue Intimacy. So, let me give you a little bit of context. Um, we uh, begin in the story, we begin with a man called Elimelech. I think that's how you say it. And he's married to a woman called Naomi, and they have two sons. And they start in Bethlehem, which is the promised place of God. This is God's place, and it literally means house of bread. Bethlehem means house of bread. So, they are here, but there is a famine in the land. There is a famine in the house of bread, in the place of promise. And so what Elimelech does is he moves with his family. He moves to Moab, which is a Gentile nation. He moves away from the place of God and he moves into the Gentile nation of Moab. And it says in the word that that he was only going to stay there a little while. But actually what happens is he gets there and he, and he kind of settles down a bit. And his sons, they marry Gentile women, they marry Moabite women and... Um, and it's obviously a lot of time goes by because he, he then dies and his sons die. And it leaves Naomi with two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. And what happens then is Ruth, uh, Naomi hears that actually back in Bethlehem, there is now a harvest. So she says to her daughters-in-law, let's go back and let's, and let's, let's, let's settle again in Bethlehem. So They make this, they start to make this journey, but on the way, she says to her daughter, do you know what? No, actually don't come with me. You need to go back because these these girls, they're Moabite women. They're not Israelites. They're not gonna, they're not gonna find much hope in Bethlehem, in in, in God's land. That they need to stay because this is the place where potentially if they went back to their families, then then they might be okay. And so Orpah says, says, Yeah, actually, I'm gonna stay, I'm gonna get get remarried, I'm gonna do that. But Ruth says, no, 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 I'm coming with you. Whatever it takes, I'm, I'm coming. And, um, and so I want to talk, first of all, about this choice to surrender, which begins this journey of intimacy. And I want to say to you, when there's a famine in your place of promise, are you tempted to move out of that place and sort it out for yourself and take control and move away from that place where God is. And just to tell you a little bit of this from my own, from my own life, I am, um, about six years ago, David and I, we felt called to move to Malawi. And, um, and just, before, just before we went, we were um, going through some kind of medical stuff and, and we found out that actually I was gonna struggle to have children. And, uh, and we, um, and, and, and we'd really known that God was calling us to go to Malawi. But I sat in the doctor's office and he said to me, do you know, the wisest thing for you to do would be to settle down and, to, um, and start trying for kids now because it's gonna, the, the longer you leave it, the, the less likely it is that you're going to have children. And, uh, and I remember thinking, goodness gracious me, what, what am I going to do? My heart, I just so wanted to be a mum, but I so knew that God was calling us to go. And we'd already left our jobs at that point when we found this out. So it was all a bit um, up in the air and a bit crazy. And, I, and, and, and the temptation was for me to leave that place of promise and to take things in my own hands and say, no, actually, I'm not going to do that, Lord, because, because this is so what I want and I don't know where you've gone in this. 
And I think sometimes when famine hits, we can lose our vision and we don't know where he is and it seems like he's not hearing our prayers. And so what, our, what we begin to do is we, we take control and we go and sort ourselves out. And it might be that you just, you still know, you know he exists and you still love him, but, but you just shut down to intimacy and you move out of that place and you just come and you say, just for a little while, Lord, I'm, I can't do this to that level anymore. I'm just going to stay here a little while. But do you know what happens is something inside you begins to die. There's no life when we take control and begin to try and build our own kingdom. Something inside us begins to die. And you see what Ruth was doing. She, she actually, she was in a place when she chose to go with Naomi and she says, so I'm going to read this because it's one of my favorite parts of scripture. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. She commits to Naomi, even though she has no idea what is going to happen when she leaves. She's a Moabite widow. What hope has she got going with another widow to this place where there's potentially a harvest? But she goes, and why does she go? Why does she choose to surrender? Because she's got her eyes set on something bigger than what she can see. There's something about Naomi's God. There's something about Naomi that draws her. And I want to remind you that we are people of faith. We are people who live by faith and not by sight. And Jesus calls us to walk by faith. And where, where we have been given promises from him, where there are things that you know in your heart you are called to, and you know that you've moved out of that a little bit because of stuff that's happened that you're not that happy about, I want to encourage you, get back to that place of promise. And let him speak to you in that place. Even if it doesn't all come right for, for another period of time, that's where he is. And that's where peace is. And so the first choice that Naomi made, and sorry, Ruth made, is that she chose to surrender. Surrender her control of the situation. And she surrendered to the God of Naomi. And she moved to the place of promise. Okay, so now hopefully under here, the next, okay, so we've got the threshing floor and we've got the field. Okay, so the next part of the story is that uh, Naomi and Ruth, they move to Bethlehem, here, and, um, and when they get there, uh, Ru Ruth goes out into the field and she begins to gather gleanings, so the stuff of the corn that's left behind, she gathers it up in order to feed herself and Naomi. So it says, Ruth, uh, Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick the leftover grain behind anyone else in whose eyes I find favour. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. So, Ruth gets to the place of promise with Naomi. She gets to God's land. There is a harvest there, so that's great. But instead of sitting there and waiting for stuff to happen, she gets out into the field and she begins to gather. This is a, this is a lady who is, she is choosing to serve, she is choosing to give her life for Naomi, to gather, to go out there, to take that risk. I just want to remind you, she's a Moabite widow. Okay, this is a dangerous thing for her to do, actually. She's going into a field where she's not going to be, um, she's not going to be liked that much, but she's, get, she's taking the risk to serve Naomi. And I want to suggest to you that if we want to be in a place of intimacy with our Heavenly Father, then to make the choice to serve positions us in that place. It just so happened that she goes to the field of Boaz, who is to be her kinsman redeemer. He is the one who's going to move her out of this place of this position of hopelessness and into a place of life and expectation. It just so happens that when she chose to serve, she was in the place of blessing. And I want to encourage us today, there are some of you who feel disconnected from God at the moment. And actually, you, are, uh, you know that there's stuff in your life and you, and you want him to bless it and you want to you do stuff for him, you want to live for him, but it's not happening. And I want to encourage you um, just to think, who is it that you're serving? We are called to be people who serve others. 
You know, Jesus himself exemplified this. He came to earth as a man and he gave himself up for us. And he, you know, that, that, that amazing story where he washes the feet of the disciples and he says, go and do likewise. You know, we are called to serve others. And, and, you know, we will feel disconnected if we're so preoccupied with building our own kingdoms that we lose something of the intimacy with God in that place of serving. Okay. So, living for ourselves moves us out of the place of encounter and blessing as we seek to build our own kingdoms. Galatians 5 says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received, this is 1 Peter 4.10, to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Are you committed to serving God, no matter how menial the task? And do you know what? As a mum... Sometimes I really struggle with this, if I'm completely honest. There are days when I've done the same thing again and again and again that I think, do you know what university I went to? Do you know what degree I have or what job I did? No, because they are only three and one. But (laughs) I can feel that what is this that I'm doing? But do you know what? This is my place of serving. This is my place of intimacy. This is my place of blessing and promise that God has called me to. This is where I connect with him and he can change me and transform me to be kingdom to my children and to the people around me. So whatever you're doing, whatever, wherever you're living at the moment, whatever it is that you're doing, if it feels menial and you, you think this isn't it, maybe it is. Because maybe this is Boaz's field for you. Okay, so choosing to surrender, choosing to serve, and finally, choosing to pursue intimacy. She moves from the field to the threshing floor. So Boaz, and I like this bit. Boaz, um, he, he sees that Ruth is in the field. He, he, rec- he sees her, he recognises her um, as being, she stands out to him, let's put it that way. And, um, and so he says, uh, it says here, as she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some of the stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up. Don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening, and then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to a bit about an ephah of flour. So, so, so Boaz begins to get the workers to leave gleanings for Ruth. He's seen her. Her serving draws his attention to her. And he begins to, to leave these gleanings. And um, I believe this morning that that, that, there are, that God, he's leaving gleanings for some of us. And I want to say, are you seeing the gleanings that he's leaving? You see, some of us, actually, we do do serving really well. In fact, we, we spend our lives serving. We know whose field it is we're working in, and we are out there every day doing it for God, serving people. But actually, we, we're feeling that disconnect And we're feeling the disconnect because God wants more than just us serving him. He is wooing us into a place of intimacy. And some of us, we need to recognize the gleanings that he's leaving. Maybe it's just, um, maybe it's a beautiful sunset. And you see it and it draws your heart to God. Or maybe it's an encouraging word that somebody speaks to you. Are you listening out for his gleanings that are drawing you in to be near to him? Okay. So uh, we move on to um, to the threshing floor. Can I I just have the next scripture up? Because I can't remember the... Thank you. So Ruth 3, 1 to 4. It says, um, Naomi's speaking to... 
Ruth and she says, my daughter, I must find a home for you where you'll be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, get dressed in your best clothes, go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying, go and uncover his feet and lie down and he'll tell you what to do. Now, this has always sounded slightly strange to me um, as to what exactly this is all about. Um, <laughs> but we'll go with it, okay? Because it's got, it's got some uh, context to it, but I'm not going to go there right now. But this is what I believe. In order to, to move into intimacy, no, in order to be in that place of promise, we need to be pursuing intimacy with God. But there are some things that Ruth had to do before she was... Um, before she came into that place of being so close to Boaz. So she, first of all, she washes herself. She washes herself. She makes herself clean. And I just wonder whether um, there are some of you today, you want intimacy with God, but there's something that's getting in the way. Maybe it's, maybe it's a habit that you've got that is, you know that it's not healthy and it's stopping you from pushing through into where the Father is. I just want to encourage you that if that's the case, then just just get to that place of repentance. Get on your knees. You're not stuck there. You're never stuck there. The Holy Spirit can cleanse you and move you out of that when you repent. So wash yourself and get with him. Uh, The next thing is she changes her clothes. Remember, she's a Moabite widow. She's got widow's attire on. Okay, and she changes her clothes and and Naomi says, put on your best clothes. She changes out of what she has and she puts on a new outfit. And I want to, um, you know, there are some of us here who will be, you're wearing stuff that is defining you by past stuff. Okay, so she, she was a widow and what she wore was defining her as a widow. But in order to move forward into that place of being a bride of Boaz, she needed to change what she was wearing. And I believe there are some of us here, there's stuff that's happened in your past and you keep going back there and you keep putting on the same outfit. And I feel like God is saying, cast it off. It doesn't define you anymore. Cast off that stuff Put on who you are in me and come. Let, let's be together. Changing your clothes. Do you know, there's a really significant point, actually, um, that really struck me as I was reading this. All the way through this story, Ruth is defined as the Moabite or the Moabitess. But when she's at the feet of Boaz, she speaks to him and she describes herself as his handmaiden. Already in his presence, the definition of herself has changed. She's moved from being the Moabitess to being his handmaiden. Those thoughts in your head that go round and round, they don't define you. What he says about you defines who you are. And in that place, that's where you walk in freedom. And if you need to hear afresh what he is saying of you, if you need his help to get off the stuff that you've been carrying and to change your clothes, then he is here today to say, come on, I've got an outfit for you. You can come and be mine. You come and hear what I'm saying of who you are. Okay, so she washes herself, she changes her clothes. She anoints herself with oil. I believe that this is to do with worship. Where else in Scripture do we hear, this is a rhetorical question, where else in Scripture do we hear about perfume and someone anointing with perfume? It's Mary Magdalene pouring the, feet, the, the, the perfume over Jesus' feet. And there's something about our worship that, that draws us into intimacy with God and and is a perfume to him. Now, I believe that, you know, when when Ruth put this, anointed herself with with the oils or the perfumes or whatever it was and laid it at Boaz's feet, when she left the next morning, I bet there was a scent of her perfume still lingering. 
And you know what? When we get our, ourselves into that place of just worshipping him, then it's like a fragrance that goes up to heaven and it lingers. And, and, and I believe that it's so pleasing to the Father when we worship. But what happens as well is that his Holy Spirit comes down onto us and it's like a perfume, it's like a fragrance that rests on us. So when we go out, he's anointed us with his perfume and it affects and influences those that we, we move with and are with in our day to day. So I want to encourage you to anoint yourself with the perfume of worship and let his fragrance come onto you to move into that place of intimacy. And lastly, she positions herself at his feet. She lays herself down at the feet of Boaz. She makes herself completely vulnerable. And you know what he does when she's in that place? It says that he puts his blanket over her. Now, the blanket going over her, that was a symbol of him saying, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to be your kinsman redeemer. I'm going to be the one who redeems you, who pulls you out of the place that you are and brings you alongside me. And I want to encourage you this morning. Are you willing to lay yourself at the feet of your redeemer? to surrender the control of your own rights, to surrender your own um, kind of building of your own kingdom? Are you willing to lay down and say, I want to be yours completely. Every part of who I am is yours. And to be in that vulnerable place and then to hear him say, good, because do you know what? I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to release you. I'm going to raise you up to walk and be alongside me. Because what we can do in him is so much greater than what we can do on our own. Let's live by faith and not by sight. Let's see what the Father can do as we surrender ourselves to him. So, if we want to get to the place of promise, to the place of intimacy, to see God working in our lives, we need to choose to surrender. We need to choose to serve. And we need to choose to pursue intimacy with our Father. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're just going to wait a moment. <laughs> 